this lecture, lecture four, we're going to um, talk about pipelining. So hopefully this is somewhat review. You should have seen pipelining before. Um, but we'll probably go into this a little bit more depth um, than you've done in previous classes. Um, just a quick recap. So last time, lecture three, we talked about microcoding. And this was a really effective uh, way of managing control unit complexity. That was the original design goal of microprogramming. And this was also embedded in an era when uh, you had these different technologies, logic tubes for logic, Core was main memory, and uh, ROM was various other kinds of very inexpensive and fast technology. And you had this big difference between ROM and RAM speeds. So that's what really motivated using microcode. Um, and then the thing was, once you got the idea of microcode down, it was easy to add complex instructions. And so over time, more and more complex instructions got added. But as technology advanced, and everything started being made from the same transistors, and you put things on the same chip, then ROM and RAM speed became much closer. And you really motivated to replace that fast RAM that was dedicated to holding writable microcode with instead um, RAM caches that could hold code that was relevant to the application you ran right there, or that phase of the application. And basically, the instruction sets evolved to becoming um, basically like vertical microcode. So RISC itself is very similar to very vertical microcode with a single data path operation and a pipeline execution and even the, the branch delay slots. Um, and this idea of load store register rich ISAs, which is really what Cray pioneered, we'll talk about that in a lecture or two, um, was really just performed better in this new VLSI technology. Um, so the way people look at performance, there's this iron law, which you should be very familiar with, which is how you, just one formulation to break down the components contributing to execution time. So you have the um, you know, time to run the program is broken down into instructions in the program, cycles that each instruction takes to execute CPI, and then the average, uh, then the cycle time in the machine, the time per cycle. So instructions per program depends on the source code, compiler, ISA. Uh, cycles per instruction depends on the ISA and the microarchitecture. Uh, how complex are the instructions and how capable is the microarchitecture at executing them. And the cycle time basically depends on the microarchitecture, how much work you're trying to have the logic gates do in every clock cycle, as well as the speed of the base technology. So if you look at different architectural machines, styles of machine. So microcoding machines, you know, CPI is tend to be greater than one, typically, you know, five to ten cycles per instruction. As you go through that uh, microcode sequence of fetching instructions and then executing them, jumping back. Um, but the cycle time can be very short because the micro machine is designed around uh, a very short tick, usually. Um, now, a single cycle unpipeline machine, you can build, if you have a single simple instruction set, you can make a machine that in one clock cycle does everything all of one instruction. And the nice thing about that, the CPI is one by definition, um, but the cycle time can be very long. Right, so the idea of pipelining is you would like to get the short cycle time here, but the low CPI as well. And you do that by overlapping the pieces of execution of different instructions as they go through the machine. So you know, here's a classic um, five-stage risk pipeline you should have seen before. Um, and this is maybe slightly different. We just put the registers. Um, th the registers in this design have been designed to work with synchronous uh, memories where you need a clock edge to read the memory the instruction cache and the data cache, and also the registers, actually. So you notice the registers are at the output of the memories here. Um, so you know, the first stage is instruction fetch. So you take the program counter, feed that to the instruction cache. Sometime later, you get the instruction captured in the instruction register at the end of the clock cycle. Uh, then you have the decode stage, where you um, take the value instruction bits, decode them, figure out what control for that. Also pull out the register fields that are needed, read out the registers you're going to use. Um, also pull out any immediate operand that's encoded in the instruction bits. Uh, these then get fed into the execute stage. So in the execute stage, you have the ALU, but also some muxing logic to get the correct operands into the ALU. So whether it's a register file value or an immediate value going to the ALU. Um, and notice this is the condition coming out of the ALU uh, to, to determine which way a branch is going to go. So then the result of the LU, you'll capture another pipeline register. Also notice here, we'll be holding on to a value, the store data value coming out of the reg file as well, if it's a store instruction. Then we have the memory phase, um, where we take the address and possibly store data and do a read or a write to the data cache optionally. And if we're not doing a memory instruction, we just pass the data value, the result value on down the pipeline to the final stage, which is write back, which takes either the you know, the, the result of the LU or the value loaded from the data cache and uh, mucks one of those into the write port of the register file, right? So this is a pretty standard five-stage. This is the classic five-stage risk pipeline. Okay, so um, 
Now, when we're talking about CPI, uh, remember the microcoding machine, remember with CPI, the, the goal is you should average over lots of instructions, not just one instruction at a time. So a microcode machine is pretty simple. You just add all these things together. So, you know, here's three instructions, the example from before, seven, five, 10 cycles, CPI here is 7.3. Um, if you have an unpipeline machine, you have you know one cycle per instruction, but in very long cycles. So three instructions, three cycles, CPI is one. The goal of a pipeline machine is to really overlap um, the pieces of all the instructions so that um, you know basically three instructions finish in three cycles, and so the CPI here is basically one. Right? You just need to look at the instructions crossing the finishing line when they're done and how fast that's happening, and basically one instruction is completing every clock cycle, so CPI is one. Yeah, so a five-stage pipeline does not have a CPI of five, it's just to remind people, right? Um, so the difficult thing about pipelining, pipelining would be easy if it wasn't for the fact, the fact that instructions interact um, with each other in the pipeline. So, um, and there's different forms of interaction, and we call these interactions hazards. So you have, um, if an instruction needs uh, a resource being used by another instruction in the pipeline, so a piece in the machine, some functional unit, we call that a, a structural hazard. Um, if you depend, uh, another way you can interact is an instruction depends on some value produced by an earlier instruction. Now, if the dependence is on a data value, we call that a data hazard. If the dependence is on something that tells you which address you should be fetched from, then that's a control hazard. So that's both branches and exceptions. So they're both examples of a control hazard. So you're depending on the early instruction to know where you should be fetched from, where this next instruction is coming from. Um, so techniques to handle the hazards generally add bubbles or some, something in the pipeline. You need to manage it in some way, and that's usually why your CPI is greater than one. You know, something's happening, you have to wait, and that's why the CPI uh, increases beyond one. So just a few examples of pipelining and CPI. Um, you know, this is the best case. Three instructions finish in three cycles. Uh, maybe you have a bubble. This instruction has to pause, and these are just wasted cycles. So that CPI, that would be, you know, three and four, that would be 1.3. And his, you know, both these instructions have some pause, so that would be a CPI of 1.67, right? Um, so how do we handle the hazards? So structural hazards are the easiest to handle. Um, that's basically because two instructions need the same hardware at the same time. Um, and you can always fix these by adding more hardware. Um, so one option is, Whatever they're fighting over these two instructions, just make sure there's more of that thing, whether it's a write port to register file or a multiply unit or something. Just add more hardware, and you can always fix a structural hazard. Um, if you don't want to add more hardware, the other way is just to um, stall, and usually you let the older instruction in the program go first and use the resource, then, let, then the newer instruction will wait, and then later take the resource. Right? You typically want the older instructions to go first because it's more likely other things are waiting on them than the newer instruction. And also to avoid deadlock, you want to, you know that the older instruction cannot depend on the newer instruction. Uh, um, so you just want to let that go, go through. So you can always add hardware to avoid um, those hazards. And one of the nice things about the classic RISC five stage pipeline is the instruction set and the pipeline were designed. So there, was no, there are no structural hazards by design. So you know, the, the no, no, no two instructions at different stages in the pipeline can compete for the same resource. That's by design in the, classic five risk, um, so you don't have to have any logic to check for it. Um, now, if you start adding more functional units, for example, a multiply divider or floating point, um, you know, going beyond the simple integer pipeline, then you can start having um, structural hazards. For example, if a multiplier takes you know, 16 clock cycles and you have a second multiply instruction comes along while the first one is still executing, you're gonna have a structural hazard. So data hazards, so the next class of hazards. So some terminology. Um, so there are different types of terminology for this. Um, architects use this, um, read after write, write after read, write after write hazard is the way of naming the different hazards, whereas compiler writers use these terms, data dependence, anti-dependence, and output dependence, right? I find the architects one very simple and methodical, so, because um, what it basically says is, you know, read after write means that the read should happen after the write of the relative operand, <laughs> right? And write after read means the write should happen after the read, and write after write, the write should happen after the other write. So it's very clear what these mean. These, I always have to look up what these actually mean. Um, so anyway, and these are shorter to write as well. So this is the ones we use in the class, right? But I just wanted you to have this as well. So for a string of 
uh, register register instructions like this. Uh, RK gets RI op some RJ. Um, so read after write has it means basically the first instruction writes a value into a register that the second instruction reads from that register. So R3 is written here, it's read there. So these two instructions have a read after write hazard between them. The antidependence is the other way around, the write after read, where the first instruction reads a value from register R1, and you have to make sure that value is read by this instruction before that register is overwritten with a new value from the following instruction. So R1 is overwritten there. You want to make sure it's not overwritten before this guy reads the value that was in R1. So in output dependence, um, right after write has a two instructions write the same register with different values, and you need to make sure that after this last instruction is executed, the later value is held in R3, right? So you can't have R3 written with this value afterwards, right? So you have to make sure this write happens after that write to keep the correct value in the register. Okay, so those are data hazards. Um, so basically handling data to hazards, there's three basic strategies people use in architecture. Um, interlock, bypass, and speculate. Um, so interlock is just wait for the hazard to clear. And this will always work in a machine where the older instructions have priority, which is usually where you design the machine. So the older instruction, um, notice all of the hazards are something after something else. So you just wait for the newer thing, just wait till the thing you have to be after has happened, right? So if I read after write, I'm gonna wait till the write's done then I'll do the read. Or write after write, I'll wait till the first write's done, then I'll do my write. So you can always handle these just by interlocking and waiting, um, sort of in the issue stage. So don't even try and do the instruction until the hazard's gone. So that's an interlock. Um, bypassing is a technique you can use to um, avoid hazards by um, grabbing a value as soon as it's available. And this is primarily to reduce read after write hazards. So I can read a value as soon as it's available anywhere in the machine, right? And, uh, uh, resolve it and we'll just talk about bypassing. Hopefully you've seen this already. Um, finally, you can always speculate. So interlocking and bypassing kind of let the right thing happen, the correct value. You know it's the correct value you're going to be obtaining either by waiting for the hazard to clear or by bypassing the correct value. Speculation is a very common technique these days, which is basically guessing on the value. So I don't actually have the value. I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm just going to guess and then correct if I got it wrong. Right, so speculation is also a technique you can use to avoid um, data hazards. Um, so if we just look at um, interlocking versus bypassing, so here's a little two instruction sequence. So I'm just adding to X1, subtracting from it. Um, you know, for my, my five stage pipeline, if I do interlocking, here's this add instruction going down the pipeline, fetch, decode, execute. Um, now if the subsequent instruction is this subtract, you know, it gets into decode, and at that point realize, oh, I can't actually the value yet, it's still an execute up there. So I just have a bubble, now just interlock. So then this subtract instruction is gonna stay in the decode stage. So you throw in, a bubble goes down the pipeline, the subtract instruction stays in the decode stage, All right? And then here's another cycle of bubble. So the instruction is just staying in the decode stage and I'm setting another bubble down the pipeline. Now there's two bubbles down going down the pipeline. Um, third bubble, and finally, um, this value gets to the register right backstage, is written to the register file, I can read it out during decode. And now finally the subtract gets to execute, right? So I've just done this with interlocking, right? No bypassing, just interlocking. Just wait until that value is actually available in the register file. Okay, so obviously, you know, waste a lot of time waiting for that instruction to show up. Um, now if you bypass, the idea is as soon as the value is produced at the end of the LU stage and execute, I can just feed that into the, the following instructions execute stage as well. So I bypass around the LU. I don't have to wait for the value to propagate down the pipeline and get into the register file during write back, right? So there is no bubble, there's no interlock. So bypassing is a very standard thing you do in, in, or in order pipelines. So the thing about bypassing, you have to add the extra paths to do that. So here's the original pipeline, right? And so when you add the bypass path, it's actually extra hardware. So I now need a path that goes from the output of the LU here and feeds it back around through this MUX to the input to the LU. This might be drawn a little differently than you've seen it before because we wanted to make the pipeline stages lined up with the output of the, the storage elements, right? So bypassing is actually done at the beginning of the execute stage in this design, right? So there's MUXs here at this point. But this is one path. So this says the output of the LU can be come in here instead of the value I read from the register file. So if I'd overwritten the register that's coming through this A port in this instruction, I would take that value 
and use that instead of the stale value that I read out here for this instruction. Okay, so you know, to actually add, you have to add all the bypasses, so this ALU operation, not only can I feed into this port of the ALU, I need to feed in the other port of the ALU. Um, and also, potentially, if I'm doing a store, I need to bypass into the store data value also that I'm gonna capture here. So what you find is that you add all the bypasses in, there's quite a lot of extra hardware to add in all of the data paths and the muxes to let the value show up anywhere that it could possibly be used. Um, from any place it could be produced or be waiting in the machine. Right, and there's additional, I think it's actually missing, there's probably a path from here as well. Um, from these values as well, it should be muxed around. Oh yeah, I guess that's here, yep. Right, so this is also a instruction two ahead um, of you could also produce the values, not just the instruction immediately ahead, any instruction behind you that hasn't finished yet could be have values that you wanna bypass in. Okay, so when you say fully bypassed, it means every path that could be bypassed is bypassed in the machine. And so in simple pipelines, usually they're pretty much fully bypassed, except for some very odd, unusual cases that you may not use very often. For example, you know, jump and link writes the PC and bypassing that value, you may not do that. You may just interlock in that case because it doesn't show up often enough to be worth adding the extra complexity, All right? Um, so that's interlocking and bypassing. The final technique is speculation. So you can just speculate on the values. So instead of waiting for value to be produced, just guess what it's gonna be. Um, and, you know, so far this is it's actually used a lot, but it's only really effective in a few areas. Um, branch prediction is the big one. So if, you know, instruction, you can guess which way a branch is going to go very accurately these days. Um, but also, like in the x86 machines, they actually do um, uh, stack pointer updates. They predict how the stack is going to move to figure out the address of the stack so they can do disambiguation and figure out when to do loads and stores to the stack earlier. Um, and also generally in load store queues, um, people do a lot of guessing about memory addresses. They can tell again whether there's any dependencies between loads and stores in flight. So these are cases where we are using value speculation in modern machines. Um, sort of the, the full on value speculation where you do a load from memory and you're guessing what value that load will have, that doesn't seem to work very well. So it hasn't, although there's been lots of proposals, people have tried it, it's pretty hard to do much better than just the structure you need to hold the value prediction, you may as well turn that into a cache and you know, have it not be coming from memory but be coming from the cache instead. So it's very difficult to do that full on value speculation, but it's very useful to do it in these sort of restricted areas. Um, but this, again, removes these read after write data hazards. You basically replace it with a speculation, and later you check to see, did I speculate correctly? And then you need a correction mechanism if you got it wrong. Um, okay, so control hazards. Um, so this is where architects spend a lot of time, because these are some of the hardest things to uh, get right, and it's one of the biggest performance bottlenecks because I don't even know what instruction I'm supposed to be doing until I uh, resolve this control hazard. Um, so something um, is sort of think about is what do you need from instructions to calculate the next PC? Um, so if you see an unconditional jump instruction, um, well one thing is you need the opcode. I need to know this instruction is an unconditional jump versus some other instruction, right? So when I see that instruction, um, I need to know the program count or an offset of where it's jumping to. Depending on the ISA, um, like in RISC-V, you need to know the program counter because unconditional jumps are relative to the program counter, right? Um, for a jump register instruction, again, I need to know the opcode. I need to know it is a jump register. I need to know the register value. So now jump register is jumping to the PC that's held in a data register, right? So I need that data register value to know where to jump to. Um, and in RISC-V, there's an offset added to that register value as well. Okay, and then for additional branches, I need to know the opcode. Um, I need to look at the registers to get the condition and evaluate the condition. Um, again, I need the program count and the offset to know where to branch to because they're relative to the current PC. And so these are the obvious ones where I'm seeing one of these jumps or branches. And obviously I need to know it's a jump or branch so I can tell what the next PC is. But even all the other instructions, you still need to know it's opcode because you need to know it's not a branch or a jump. Right, you need to know that it's just going sequentially uh, down through uh, all the code. Um, so if you look at you know control for information in the simple pipeline, um, you know the PC is known right at the start. You know it's what you use to fetch this instruction, so you always know instructions PC early. Um, only after you get the bits from memory um, do you know the opcode and the offset to the PC. Um, 
only after you fetch the register values do you know the branch condition. Um, and also, if it's a jump register, you only know the target address after you fetched it from the register file. So, you know, there's different stages where you get different pieces of information about the coming control transfer, right? It kind of builds up as you go down the pipeline. So in RISC-V, um, if you're doing uh, unconditional, the unconditional PC relative jumps, these are just jumps with some offset from the current PC. Um, so the way they actioned is um, you have a mux in front of the PC fetch, which is telling you whether you just go sequentially from plus four to the next instruction, or you should mux in the new PC value. The new PC value is calculated from um, um, the PC you had before, um, plus the immediate bits from the instruction, right? So you're adding the PC plus an offset to give you the, uh, the PC target address. Right, then finally you have to look at the bits, decode the bits to determine this is a jump instruction. If this is a jump instruction, then mux this into the program counter. And the final thing you have to do is kill the instruction um, that was inf incorrectly fetched, right? Because of the pipeline delay, the simple pipeline is just going to blindly fetch PC plus four until you redirect it. And when you redirect it, you have to get rid of all the instructions that are along the incorrect path, right? So this kill instruction will kill the instruction that was incorrectly fetched and turn it into a bubble. Um, so if you look at the pipelining, so there's a jump target. Um, so, you know, during decode, you realize that it's a jump, right? And then that tells you to do these things to the later pipeline stages. You do the kill to insert a bubble here. You also redirect the PC mux at the start of the fetch to then fetch from the correct address. So then there's a one cycle bubble for that unconditional jump. Right, so unconditional jumps in a simple pipeline is a one cycle bubble. And then here you're executing at the um, target address. Okay, that's just finishing it out. Um, now, this kind of problem of there being this control bubble, um, you know, the early risk machine saw this and it was very frequent. You know, basically branches and jumps happen once every six or seven instructions on average in general code. Um, and so, the risk idea, the early risks adopted this idea that actually came from the microcode engine. So the microcode engines had this idea of a delayed branch because um, the microcode engines themselves were pipelined. And um, so the early risks adopted this idea. And so you would change the user visible ISA now to have these semantics of the branch only ac is actioned one instruction or two instructions after um, you see the branch instruction. So um, basically if you have this instruction jump target at location you know, hex 100, hex 104, the following instruction, this is always executed. So the jump target doesn't take effect for one more cycle, right? So if you look at the pipeline diagram now, it's completely full. So you just see the jump target here in decode. You say, okay, I'm going to redirect the PC. I don't kill the bubble. I just let it run. And so that means this, the machine just blindly goes ahead and fetches this subsequent instruction and pushes it down the pipeline. Now, what this means is though the software has to figure out how to compile the assembly program. It has to figure out how to fill that delay slot with useful work. And they can either do that by finding some instruction ahead of the branch that didn't, that doesn't um, have a dependency to the branch. So the branch doesn't depend on it. And you can just move that to be later and do it in the delay slot. Or you would look for a, an instruction at the target that you could move into here. Um, uh, and it'll, it'd have to be an instruction that would be okay to execute even if you didn't jump to the target but just fell through, right? So the ideally, you look for something before the branch and move it after the branch into the branch slot because that was something you're going to do anyway, regardless of which way the branch went. Or you would start looking at instructions that are at the destination of the branch or the fall-through path and move one of those into the delay slot. Um, but it had to be something that was okay to, you know, either it was done on both paths or if you did it on one or the other path, it wouldn't matter. You just overwrite the result if it went the other way. So the compiler would have to do this work to, to figure out how to fill these um, delay slots. Okay, so um, now the problem with this is it's really um, uh, mixing up the microarchitecture with the architecture. So this was a kind of cool idea, and everybody did this in the early risks because it seemed to give a reasonable performance win, and it was very simple to do. Basically, you just avoided adding the kill stuff, and the machine just did it anyway. So they made it part of the ISA. Um, but ever since you know the 90s, people have just not adopted this. Yep. Um, the very early risk, no, they just had relied on this. There was no read. There was only a five-stage pipeline, and there's basically no branch penalty 
once you had the branch delay slot. Well, what happened was the, the, the branch penalty was really the no ops you had to insert when you couldn't find something to put in that branch delay slot, right? And so these early machines didn't need branch prediction because um, the pipelines were so short and they had the delay slot filled. You know, it, roughly the stats were at the time, something like 70% of the time there was something useful in the delay slot if you only had one delay slot. Um, the bigger problem was later as things started evolving, they wanted deeper pipelines. So instead of one delay slot, there was two. And the second one was much harder to fill than the first one, like maybe 30% of the time it was filled. And then people went to wider machines with dual issue or quad issue, and then there was, you know, instead of one or two delay slots, you had like four or eight delay slots, or maybe 12 delay slots. And, and you know, one of the TIDSPs actually has 40 instructions in the delay slot, right? So, you know, good luck finding 40, unless you're doing a very simple loop, which is what it's designed to do. It's very unlikely you'd fill, you know, 40 instructions in the delay slot, right? So, um, so part of the problem people saw with this was, um, as you built more advanced microarchitectures, it just was the wrong size. It's just like you had this small benefit from this one delay slot, but it really made the machine more awkward. You had to, when you weren't, didn't really have that same simple pipeline, you had to remember to always do the one instruction after the branch, and that really complicated the microarchitecture. Um, so it went from being something that made things simpler to something that made things considerably more complicated. Um, also, there was these performance issues that um, you actually had to add those no ops to the uh, user level code, and that just you know took space in instruction cache. So there was more iCache misses from it. Um, also, there's like these little weird effects, like you would get to a branch right at the end of a cache line. The lay slot was on the next cache line, but that took a miss, right? The branch was taken. You'd have to wait to get the cache iCache miss to come back to retrieve an instruction that you found out was a no op, right? And then you would go take the, the jump to the target address, right? Um, and the other thing that really happened was, you know, better branch prediction came along. So, you know, the notion of the software trying to fill this in kind of went away with, and now the hardware could do a better job of actually filling in that branch shadow with useful work by using prediction and speculation, basically over time. So, you know, ever since the sort of post 9090 is kind of the, the dividing line, any risk ISA designed after that doesn't have delay slots, right? So it was really a, you know, 80s thing, right? <laughs> this is really you can you can date your ISA to be an 80s ISA if it has a delay slot. Um, because by, yeah, but basically by 1990, people started having superscalar risk implementations. And these, this issue showed up, and more deep, and deeper pipelines, yep. There's like some, like, embedded platforms for these delay slots, just to simplify that operation. Well, the thing to realize is that all of, all of the ISAs designed in the ISADs are still around. So, <laughs> and those ISAs, they couldn't get rid of the branch delay slot. So, for example, you know, MIPS, ARM v7, um, those have um, delay slots, because that's part of the... ISA specification or Spark. Spark is still used on machines that has a delay slot. So these ISAs that were designed in the 80s, they still have the delay slot and they're living with it now. Like it's a constant source of rotation for them. The annoying thing is the compiler writers have to still fill the delay slot even though it's you know an annoying thing for the implementers to actually work with. So you know everybody's upset. Now the software guys are upset and the hardware guys are upset, <laughs> right? So yeah, these, these feature, I say is a long lived. I say don't go away. Um, right. So, so that was just unconditional jump. Let's take a look at conditional branches. Now, one thing in RISC five is the conditional branches are based on a comparison of two registers, and so it actually we don't get the condition until during the execute stage, where the LU actually looks at the two register values, does a comparison, and so what this means is that you have to kill not only the instruction entering decode, but also instruction entering execute. So you have two kill signals coming in. So you're going to kill, create two bubbles in the pipeline every time a branch is taken. Now, if the branch is not taken, the machine just keeps going straight ahead and just fetching sequentially. But when the condition says you should take the branch, um, you're going to mux in the, you know, so now we have a different um, adder producing, you know, one cycle later, you know, with this the program counter of this instruction and the immediate from this instruction are used to create the branch offset as opposed to the unconditional jump where it was done a cycle earlier in this pipeline. So now, um, if we look at the pipelining of this, so in the execute stage, you determine whether the branch is taken. If it's taken, you're going to kill both this instruction and this instruction and then redirect the PC to the target here. So in this stage, you're calculating the new 
uh, branch address and fetching it here. Right, so now there's two bubbles in a simple, simple design. So actually, there is five eyes. Say we deliberately went with, I mean, MIPS, if you look about at the MIPS eyes, say they tried to add a faster branch compare that only checked for zero. Uh, the two, sorry, check for quality between two registers. And they did that because they were trying to squeeze this comparison logic one cycle earlier. So it'd only be one cycle of delay and they had a branch delay slot that would cover that one cycle of delay. So RISC five is designed an era where we're assuming there's gonna be no delay slots, but there is gonna be branch prediction. And so having the richer branch compares actually saves on code size and um, actually makes things work better once you have branch prediction. So a more complicated branch instruction actually uh, works out better. Okay. Um, so final case is similar, but it's jump register. So this is where you're jumping to a PC held in a register. So again, you have to wait for the register value to be fetched and bypassed and execute. And notice you might have to bypass this register value, right? And then kill the two instructions in the shadow and then mux in the new address here to jump to the target. And again, as we'll see, jump registers, you also use prediction for use a branch target buffer that'll predict the target address as well as whether it's taken or not. Okay, so in a simple pipeline, um, you know, instructions not going to be dispatched every cycle. And some of the reasons are, you know, full bypassing may be too expensive. You may not have all the paths in there. Usually you have all the frequently used paths, but some infrequently used paths you may, um, may figure it's better to drop them because they'll make the cycle time shorter having less logic um, and just take the hit in CPI. So this is an iron law trade-off. Um, one thing is loads have a two cycle latency. So you have address calculation and then you have the memory access. And so those inherently two cycles long. And so you can't do the single cycle bypass. Um, so you're gonna have to wait to use the value of the load at least one cycle longer. Now, what was interesting, MIPS 1, one of the first risk commercial risk guys says, they, so MIPS actually stood for um, um, microprocessor without interlock pipe stages. That was what the acronym expanded to. And their goal was to remove all the interlock logic from the CPU. So there was no interlock check at all. And they would just have the raw pipeline there and software was writing, to this writing code for this raw pipeline. One of the ways they did that was by saying even those loads would have a load delay slot. So you did a load instruction, the following instruction could not use the result register. It would be undef undefined. So you had to put a no op in before you use the value of the load instruction. So you had a load, load into X1, you couldn't have a use of X1 in the next instruction. If, you, if that was the only thing you had to do, you put a no op in and then have a use of X1 one instruction later. Okay, and that was done so they didn't have to have any interlocks in the, the machine at all. Now, turned out that was a bad idea and they removed it in MIPS2. Um, and so now they added back the interlocks, right? Um, and the reason was that, um, so what's the problem with doing low delay slots? What do people think? Why is it a bad idea? Code expansion, right. So the problem is all those low delay slot no ops took code space. So even though the performance you think will be the same in the pipeline, the problem is that your iCache, you know, there's like a non-negligible hit in terms of extra capacity needed to hold those no ops because they're explicitly represented in the code. And so that was one of the big problems. And actually the adding interlock was a trivial amount of hardware. It wasn't like they were saving much hardware for the interlock check. So it's kind of a way of doing code compression. I could, you know, instead of encoding my stalls in the instruction stream in the iCache, I could just dynamically recreate them using the, uh, the hazard check, um, right? So they removed that in MIPS too. Um, notice they didn't remove the low delay slot. Um, yeah, and also we, we can't get rid of all the uh, control hazards, so we're still gonna have some bubbles from that. Um, now one thing, um, when you have these software visible delay slots, um, you know, a lot of no op instructions get inserted by the compiler. So when you're thinking about the iron law, the right way to think about this is that um, the no ops will actually reduce your CPI, right? The no ops will reduce your cycles per instruction because you've added more instructions that execute really quickly. The no ops execute very quickly. So in your overall instruction mix, by adding no ops, you're gonna improve your CPI. It's gonna go down, right? However, you've increased the instructions per program, right? You've added these no ops that you have to execute. They execute fast, but it's additional instructions in your program. So basically they reduce, they reduce CPI, but increase instructions per program. So that's the way to figure them into the iron law, right? When you're looking at the iron law. Um, okay, so those are the easy hazards. So one of the real difficult hazards is uh, basically traps and interrupts. So these are 
you know, disruptions to the regular control flow, not some things managed by um, the program. So, um, so the terminology we use in the class is that um, an exception is uh, an uh, unusual internal event caused by the program during execution. So something about the program you're currently running raises an exception. So there's something, you know, some signal in the hardware goes off saying something happened during this program's execution. An example would be a page fault or an arithmetic overflow, right? Um, a trap is an action caused by, can be caused by the presence of an exception. So for example, um, if you get a page fault, that's an exception. Normally that would usually cause a trap, which stops the program execution and redirects you into supervisor mode to do something about it. Um, now, thing to realize is not all exceptions cause traps. So, for example, the IEEE 40 point standard defines exceptions as just, for example, I get underflow on a floating point operation. That will raise an exception flag. A bit will be set in the machine state. It won't necessarily, on most machines, the most configurations people run, by the people run their code, it won't actually cause a trap. But there'll be an exception raised in a sticky flag that you can check later explicitly in the code, right? So that's the distinction between exception, if something happened, and a trap, you actually took an action based on that thing happening. Um, so then interrupts though are external events. So something outside the running program, asynchronous to the program you're doing, causes an event and you then want to go to the supervisor mode. Um, and the thing is we group these things together um, because usually they're handled by the same mechanism inside the microarchitecture. You kind of treat both of these things as you know, uh, unprogrammed transfer of control to some supervisor mechanism. Okay, so uh, brief history of exception handling. Um, so we talked about the analytical engine, and this thing had overflow exceptions. You had an overflow, the machine would jam, ring a bell, right? So example of raising an exception. Um, now the first system with traps was actually the Univac one um, in 1951. So this would, um, if you got arithmetic overflow, it would either automatically jump to a two instruction fix up routine at address zero. So it's kind of something happened, an overflow happened, it would then automatically jump to some code that would do something. You could program what would happen, an exception. Or you could tell the machine just to stop if that happened. Right, so that's an example of a you know, precise trap on arithmetic arithmetic exception. Uh, a later model, they actually added um, external interrupts. So something from outside could cause the machine to redirect control flow. And they actually use this to do real-time wind tunnel, uh, gathering experiments from a real-time wind tunnel. Um, but actually the first machine with IO interrupts, IO interrupts was a thing called Disiac in 1954. And this actually had two program counters. And what they did was when the interrupt came in, you swapped program counters and went to the other thread. So they kind of had an IO interrupt driven thread as well as the, the foreground user driven thread. Um, this is also an interesting machine because it was the first machine with DMA, direct memory access, where there was hardware set up to automatically transfer data into the memory from an IO device. Um, and it was also the first mobile computer. So this thing was, um, two tractor trailers, one was 12 tons, one was eight tons. <laughs> and this was really the first mobile. It was like an army machine that's used for signals processing, right? So this was really the first mobile uh, mobile computer. Uh, interesting, there's a great picture of it somewhere. I didn't bring it in this slide deck. Um, so asynchronous interrupts, um, you know, the usual way this happens in hardware now, an IO device requests attention by asserting you know, one in interrupt line in a machine, and there's usually a bunch of mechanism that takes those interrupt lines, prioritizes them, decides which interrupt should get serviced next, then raises an interrupt on the CPU, on some CPU. These days you have multiple CPUs, so you have to route the interrupts to which CPU is gonna get which interrupt. So there's a lot of complexity in modern platforms to handle that. Um, but when the processor decides to process an interrupt, it um, has to kind of stop where it is, what we call precisely, in most machines, all machines today pretty much have precise interrupts, which means that it looks like the software as if you stopped exactly at the end of one instruction before doing, so you completed everything up to that point architecturally and nothing after that point, right? So you stopped and the PC, exception PC, points at um, the instruction that took the trap, uh, took the interrupt. Um, then what usually happens is interrupts are disabled, you jump into supervisor mode and run an interrupt handler that deals with the event and then eventually jumps back to regular user mode. Um, so this adds you know, complexity to the machine. Now you have to add the sort of instruction set support. And this is sort of part of the privileged architecture generally, not something the user code needs to worry about. But the machine needs to provide a way for that handler code to save the exception PC. Um, and 
move it into the, usually just move it into the general purpose registers. Uh, you need to make sure no other interrupts can interrupt your interrupt handler, so we can get its job done and get out of the way cleanly. Um, and then um, it needs to figure out what happened, like which interrupt happened, or was it an interrupt, was it a trap? Um, was it a page fault, was it an automatic overflow, or was it an interrupt from where? So you need some way of finding out what happened in the code. And then you need some way of returning back from the handler back to regular operation. So resetting all the, the state bits, re-enabling interrupts, um, going back to user mode. So in the RISC file, we have this um, return from environment ERET instruction, which kind of, you can think of it as exception return. You just, in one instruction, you atomically re, re uh, fix all the states so you can go back to running in regular user mode. Um, so that's interrupts. Synchronous traps, though, these are um, where some particular instruction caused the problem. Like you took a page fault, that's an exception. You take a trap on that so you can go ahead and get the page from disk and bring it into memory. Um, in this case, you have to restart um, the instruction after the exception's been handled. Um, so, um, now one, one thing to note is that sometimes uh, the trap, like a page fault, you have to take the trap, handle the page fault, bring in the page from memory, then restart the instruction. Other cases, like a system call, where the user is invoking the operating system, you have to take the trap, handle the trap, and then start one instruction later. Like the system call in effect has been done by the, the handler, and you need to step over it to move on to the next instruction. You don't want to take the system call and then restart the same system call. You just get stuck in an infinite loop. Right? So you want to move past that, that instruction. Um, so in a classic sort of five-stage pipeline, how do you handle this? Well, one thing to note is that you know, multiple stages can cause exceptions at the same time, like a bad PC address, legal opcode, overflow, bad data address. All these can happen on the same clock cycle at the same time, and you have to resolve them. Um, so the usual way we do this is, um, oh, the other thing is you have to think about the asynchronous interrupts coming in from the side, and how do you handle all these? All of these can be active on the same clock cycle. So the general strategy in the simple in-order pipelines is basically you you save them all up till the, if any exception handles, capture in the register and pass it down the pipeline till you hit the commit point. So the commit point is the important concept we're going to cover in out of order machines too. The commit point was after instruction passes this this point, its effect on the machine state is irrevocable. You cannot do, you know, we've kind of committed it, we've done that instruction. But up until that point, we can undo the instruction. So the notion is we're going to gather any exceptions. The first exception and instruction sees will capture and shift down the pipeline till the end. And then we'll check to see, did this instruction have an exception? If so, we'll take the trap, record the cause, record the program counter of that instruction, and kill everything else in the pipeline and go to the handler. Um, now, if that one instruction has an exception, say here, we want to ignore any other exceptions because you want to go back to the original exception that caused you know, something to go wrong. Right? If you went from a wrong PC address, it's likely you're getting a legal opcode or overflow or something else. You take the first one. So if one exception is recorded, you ignore the rest. So it's the first one you see as it goes down the pipeline, you, you hold on to. But you only handle them in order as the instructions go through a commit point because you want to take the exceptions in program order. Right? You, you don't want to take, you know, if you see this PC address exception, you don't want to take it straight away because some other instruction, an older instruction, may not quite have got to the point at which it will trigger an exception. And that's the one you want to handle first. You want to handle the oldest instructions exceptions first. But within each instruction, you want to handle the first exception it sees going down the pipeline. Right? So this is kind of the general structure for managing that in order pipeline. So when you detect that something's gone wrong on the instruction that's about to commit, you, you kill all the pipe stages, uh, kill right back, and put the handler PC in at the front and jump to the handler. So that's the way you clean your restart precisely. And notice that one of the nice things about the way the RISC pipeline is designed is that nothing gets written back until this last stage. So we don't write back to data memory or the register file until right at this end, right at the end. But you can use the values through bypassing. Right? Before you've committed the value, you can use it by through the bypass network. But it hasn't changed the machine state irrevocably. Only when you get to the commit point, you actually update the final registers and the data cache with the, the store values. It's basically just saying what I said. Uh, just writing down what I said in words. Um, now, the thing to realize is we always speculate on exceptions. So every pipeline, in effect, is always speculating on exceptions. You, Because otherwise, you'd have to wait for every instruction to go through the whole pipeline to get to the end to see if it had an exception. right? And then you would be safe to fetch the next instruction. So the microcoded machines, that's how they worked. They would do all of one instruction, 
commit it, then go and do start doing the next instruction, right? But a pipeline machine, you don't do that. You start subsequent instructions before you finish the earlier ones. And so, um, so we're, it, you know, the other thing is exceptions are rare. That's why they're called exceptions. So you know it's kind of a good safe bet that this instruction doesn't have an exception. So you're always pipelining those, predicting they're not going to happen. Um, and then you need this you know, um, way of checking where the exceptions happened. And you know, we sort of outlined that for the simple in order pipeline, this notion of just moving all the way down. The way we recover is just by killing all these stages because we know that only past the commit point have we made an irrevocable change, right? So all the earlier stages, they don't change the state at all, so it's easy to recover just by flushing, flushing out the pipeline. Okay, so when we get to more complex pipelines, um, you know, where um, maybe you start adding floating point units that take a variable amount of time to finish, um, well, it turns out that, you know, you, you start worrying about what if these things write back out of order? How am I going to handle exceptions that happen late in a long floating point operation? Well, one strategy people do, I'll just show you some simple strategies, um, more complex in order pipeline. What you can do is just delay, follow that same pattern of just delaying the, like a floating point add, for example, um, may take a few cycles. You just delay the simpler instructions like integer add, integer load. You may add an extra stage and it just so they line up, so they all write back at the same point, and so they all cross the commit point at the same point in time. Right, so you just extend that pattern to these deeper pipelines where you put the longer instructions um, and just you know, pad the shorter instructions out to take the same amount of time as the longer ones and do the same strategy. And that's actually a very common uh, design style. Um, and what's interesting about this is if you, this kind of structure, if you look at what you have to add here when you add a floating point unit, you have these separate units, often a separate floating point register file, it's very simple to make this a, a dual issue um, superscalar. In order superscalar is just the same. You know, I fetch two instructions now. One of them could be an integer instruction. One of them can be a floating point instruction. But I can just rely on this same idea of uh, padding them all out so they all cross the commit point at the same time. So they all cross the commit point in order, in program order. And that's the way I handle exceptions. So that's, this is a very common pattern. Actually, several machines, the Alpha 121064 and the MIPS R5000, looked almost exactly like this in terms of their internal instruction. Now, these even wider ones, the UltraSpark and the Alpha 21164 were actually four wide with the same kind of simple idea. In order superscalar, this is where they handle exceptions and traps. Okay, so uh, next time we'll uh, start talking about out-of-order machines, the early out-of-order machines. But the readings for next time are on sort of early pipelining from IBM and some of the early advanced machines from IBM and also handling precise interrupts from Jim Smith, the classic paper.